Hello and welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. Ooh, my voice sounds deep. I'm Joe Johnson. Just like Barry White. <laughs> Actually, Joe Hollywood. Uh, Once again, I'm joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. Still Imaginos? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm joined by Andrew the Scorpion Walker. And uh, we... Watch out. I'll sting you. <laughs> oh, boy. This I want to see your signature shows. move later. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, today's topic is an interesting one. It, it's going to deviate a little bit from the norm. Uh, over the past few episodes, we've talked about true life crime and unsolved mysteries and stuff like that. Um, but our, our podcast always has a bit of a, a noir theme. And most noir films have the femme fatale. And uh, I believe femme fatale is, I think, French for fatal woman. And so most noir films have a woman who seduces the hero, gets him to bend to her will, and uh, do the dirty work. Like if she needs a spouse taken care of, she'll rein in some poor sap to take care of that and let him take the fall, you know. Uh, so that's a staple of uh, one of my favorite genres, uh, noir film. But as I did research into trying to find evidence of real life femme fatales, especially from like the golden age of Hollywood area, our era, uh, there's not a lot of that to report on. Uh, strangely, the fame uh, fatale trope seems to be, for the most part, Hollywood fiction. That yes, there are movies with plenty of femme fatales, but in real life, you really have to dig. I, If I might chime in my yeah. two cents, and I don't know as much of the topic uh, as you do, Joe. But just given that information, uh, it's does it kind of seem to me that the men who wrote these the scripts for these movies, they were acting out some of their own <laughs> uh, kind of sick sexual fantasies. Exactly, because, or placing the blame yeah. on the woman for well, their or, indiscretions. Some, some sort of uh, subconscious misogyny. Exactly. I, I think, I, I'm sure there's been... Uh, decent articles written about it and hey we might uh talk about that in the future yeah. if we come across it but psychologically that's that's a very strange thing to have zero to none incident incidences to have a little movement yeah a small film movement now for, you know what's interesting yeah. continuing your theme as i you know looked up real life femme fatales one of the names that came up on every list if not number one on every list uh, was a pretty famous name matahari yeah. And uh, she was a real person, uh, born in 1876, died in 1917 by firing squad after she was convicted of being a spy for Germany. Uh, she was portrayed in numerous films and television shows. And in one case, there was a 1931 film named Matahari. But with your theme that you just said, there's a lot of people who, be who believe she was not a spy and was a scapegoat. And so here we have... A real life mod, uh, uh, femme fatale, Matahari, who might not have been a femme, yeah. femme fatale in real life, but served a purpose to men to be the scapegoat to take the fall. So you're yeah. saying that there, there, there are people who say that she was not an assassin, not or? a spy, yeah, not an assassin. That she was a scapegoat and had okay. the blame pa I, placed I, on her. I, know, I have an elementary knowledge of her. Of was it World War One? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that I just. I, I thought it was a true story that she was like a Russian Red Sparrow. You know, sexy yeah. knew what she was doing, but she would kill you. His, yeah. History's written by the winners. Now, exactly. Print the legend. Do we have a Matahari, a proper Matahari film? Yeah. So I mentioned uh, that uh, Greta Garbo, who, okay. uh, you know. Uh, I thought I had. Yeah, oh, heard of, heard she of. portrayed Matahari in the 1931 film. And, and like okay. I said, there have been numerous, numerous depictions of her in film. Okay. I think I read that Zsa, Zsa Gabor played uh, Matahari in some film. Okay. Uh, so here's Hollywood putting a spin on a real person who may or may not have been right. uh, a femme fatale to begin with. But like like I said, uh, when the legend takes hold, you print the legend. And, and so she is synonymous 
with the femme fatale. So I find that interesting that even in real life, men kind of yeah. write the story. Um, another real life femme fatale, uh, even though, boy, this is this is probably the grittier side of that. Because usually when you think femme fatale, you think glamour and seduction and beauty. Um, but when you look up femme fatale online, well, a name that comes up under real life femme fatales is Eileen Carol Warnos, uh, who was portrayed in the movie Monster by uh, Charlize Theron. And <clears throat> when, when you look at photos and mug shots of Eileen, uh, not the classic beauty. As a matter yeah. of fact, Charlize Theron had to get made up to uh, soften her good looks. Um, to her credit, she won an Oscar for Best Actress for playing this uh, brutal, brutal right. person yeah. in her life. Um, but her actions sort of fit the uh, description of the femme fatale. Uh, she was a prostitute in Florida who would um, pick up clients and shoot them and rob them and leave them, leave them in ditches. And when she was caught and, uh, and uh, convicted, she, she argued that uh, every single one of those cases was self-defense. <laughs> so, hmm, maybe, maybe not. Um, but the, the, uh, the jury didn't buy it, and she was executed by lethal injection in 2002 at the age of 46. So, wow. uh, so yeah, there's, there's only a, a couple of names that came up as I was searching real-life femme fatales. So one that uh, came up was Cleopatra, and she's yep. been depicted in film numerous times. Uh, oh, okay. I only recently watched the Elizabeth Taylor version just a few years ago, and uh, it's a pretty long movie, but uh, yeah, there's another classic depiction of uh, a femme fatale that may or may not be based in uh, truth. Yes. I can you can almost guarantee that Cleopatra did not look like Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most uh, sculptures and paintings you see of her, she she was you might describe her as a handsome woman, but uh, <laughs> from from what I gather, if I if it's the right woman, she was half um, Greek, half. Egyptian, correct? Yeah. 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 And she yeah. like played both sides. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine in your mind mixing a, a beautiful Arab woman with a beautiful Greek woman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But something about her allowed her to seduce the powers of that era. So, yeah. So she's another one that comes up on lists when you when you Google uh, femme fatale. Now, like we said earlier, you know, uh, it seems like the, the femme fatale was really crafted by Hollywood, and there's no shortage of films that depict a beautiful woman as the duplicitous, backstabbing, manipulative woman who gets her way or, or may pay the price at the end, but usually it's her, her patsy that, uh, you know, ends up taking the fall on her behalf. Uh, one of my favorites uh, is Double Indemnity, 1944 yep. movie, uh, where Barbara Stanwyck uh, plays Phyllis Dietrichson, and <clears throat> she's so manipulative in the film, and uh, and uh, the Patsy just falls for it and does her bidding. If I remember correctly, she wanted her husband uh, yep. done away with, and he agrees to it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Barbara Stanwyck, really? Okay. Uh, she she talked you into it, you know? But great, great film. Uh, one that I've only seen fairly recently, the, uh, the original Postman Always Rings Twice, 1946. It was remade in the 70s, I think, with Jessica Lange and uh, Jack Nicholson. I don't recall if I saw that version of it. I remember seeing bits and pieces of it. Um, but the original version stars Lana Turner as Cora Smith, uh, another one who manipulates a man into convincing him that his her husband you know needs to be done away with um the one thing that I, I come away with watching that movie is lana turner was at her absolute peak like they they had these close-ups of her with that soft filter on and my heart hurt like ouch that's that is that something a, special that was a gorgeous woman she if, she if, if had I, a perfect face I, it was she, was, am I correct in saying that they had planned on doing the Lana Turner movie starring, what, would it be uh, Gal Gadot? Does she kind of look like Gal Gadot? I don't Wonder see Woman? the similarity, I'm trying no. To, I'm trying to remember. It was some dark-haired, huh. beautiful actress. Well, Lana Turner, who we discussed on our uh, our 
bombshell blonde bombshell episode was a beautiful blonde and known for platinum hair right maybe i'm thinking of a a a different actress yeah uh, that they're gonna do a biopic of then but I'm, I'm pretty sure I. I mean, this I is came a, across a lot. Lana this is just Turner. a guess because right now she's been in almost every movie. It seems like, at least to me, but Margot, <laughs> Margot Robbie. Right, exactly. Margot hey. does have those same doe eyes and probably can pull that off. I'll, I'll look it up. To see if All right. Anything. So yeah, so if you haven't seen the original, uh, the Postman Always Rings Twice. Give it a look. Sure. Uh, absolutely fantastic with great twists and turns. Uh, one of my favorite noir films. 1947's Out of the Past, starring Robert Mitchum. And uh, Jane Greer plays Kathy. Again, she manipulates our hero. You never see it coming. When she starts off <laughs> soft-spoken, just like, I'm just here. It's so innocent. I went, oh, okay, you're the most dangerous person. Oh, it, it was an amazing performance. And again, the twists and turns. And you know, I was just talking to someone recently. It's really kind of a neat experience. When you're watching a movie that was made in the 30s or 40s and you're seeing it for the first time and it it impacts you and manipulates you the way it was intended when it first came out. And yet here we are, you know, in the 2020s and watching a movie of the 1940s that's just as effective as it was back yep. then. And you imagine an audience sitting in a movie theater watching this for the first time and, and uh, seeing all the twists and turns. And, and that's what I love about watching these classic films for the first time. It's they're still, they still hold up today. They don't, age poorly sometimes right. you get the conversation when people go oh no i'm talking about a, a this a, a strong female character who can manipulate and do that and i go yeah like a femme fatale no no that's not what i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. what you're describing phyllis dietrich or you're describing you know gloria swanson and yeah. and sunset boulevard is like really like yeah just guys just turn on the movies and it's i'm not saying don't do your idea i'm just saying don't before you guys say, like, oh, this is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm like, yeah, easy now. <laughs> yeah, it may have been done, yeah. And another classic noir film, one of the best ever, The Maltese Falcon, uh, oh, 1941. Yeah. Uh, Mary Astor plays Humphrey Bogart like a fiddle. Uh, you know, everyone's chasing around this uh, statue that may or may not have... Uh, encrusted or embedded jewels we were talking it. about it off air that that that, oh, that scene i told you when i, I was in the uh, teenager when i saw it, I went, <laughs> and that scene when she walks in she she kisses him, i'm like wait what is happening right yeah now? andrew have you seen uh, the maltese falcon i still have never seen it no wow. it's nope. okay i mean we're getting used to this kind of conversation <laughs> that's right so. i'm trying to drag you in here but yeah um but no what, what we were talking about is uh it's one of the few movies where there's a major, major twist within the first five yeah. minutes of the movie, right. and you're like, I, "Okay, all right, you set the tone here." I've I've heard that, and uh, I've I've been spoiler free about it, but yeah, one day I do need to sit down and, and watch it. This is like our LA Confidential conversation. That's hey, right. <laughs> no, seriously, I your list has to be an okay. arm length no, long. On, honestly, got truth about LA Confidential. I saw that I could watch it on Pluto. Okay. Which kind of sucks because there's it's free, but there's commercials, you know, ninety second commercials. Yeah, well, it might be worth. So it. I went back a, week, uh, a couple days later. It was not on Pluto anymore, and it was not on anything that I could watch it for free on. Oh, I've I've noticed they switch TV shows and uh, movies rotate them distribution distributors online all, all the time. I, I may have to come in with a stack of DVDs for yeah. you one day, but I get really I, nervous because people don't return my DVDs. Hey, one at a time. <laughs> right. And I'll and I'll watch it within uh, a week. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds Speaking like, of Femme Fatale. Sounds like you got stung there, Scorpion. Yes. Kim Basinger in yes. L.A. Confidential. Classic Femme Fatale. Won an Academy Award for yes. portrayal. Yes. Uh, another one. Uh, elaborate more about the one you were talking about, uh, Sunset yeah. Boulevard, right? Yeah, with Gloria Swanson. She was, I mean... The movie is great for the opening. <laughs> the, the guy's narrated doing, by a dead yeah. man. Narrated by a dead man. It's like, yep, there I am, lying in the pool. And you like, go, wow, okay. And, you might be wondering how I got into this situation. Yeah. And it's it's a wonderful di- you know dive into the psychosis of how you see this you see this actress who can let go. She's a silent movie star who doesn't realize that times have moved on, and she has. You could you have a classic line in there, two classic lines which people never know where they can where they come from. And I hear you know younger people quote them like, "I'm ready for my close up, Mr. Deville." Yeah. Oh. And then the other one is, uh, you know, I'm not you know they're not big. It's the pictures that got small. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? The pictures. 
and, and that was actually filmed uh, at, at that that line was actually filmed at uh, the real world Paramount Studio gate. And so when you tour Paramount Studios and you're standing at that gate, uh, they're like, "This is where Gloria Swanson said her famous line." So, you know, it's interesting. We were talking about as a, a subtext of perhaps misogyny when we talk about femme fatales and they're created. But then you look at the if you do a deep dive into femme fatales, there. You know their intentions, their intelligence, their manipulation, their individuality, and you go, you know, it's 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 like a weird thing. Like guys, you know, men who are trying to create these sex objects, yet these sex, you know, these women who are sex objects of desire play men like fiddles. Mm-hmm. And if not for certain movies, it, for example, in Double Indemnity, she should get away with it. Mm-hmm. Or Kathleen Turner plays uh, in Body Heat. I forgot her character's name. Uh, Maddie, I forgot the last, but she mm-hmm. plays. She should win that one. That yeah. in that movie, she's always a step ahead of everybody. But because you can't have the villain win, yeah, you get get, get this weird ending. I'm like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> she was winning. How did she? That seems like an. So yeah. it's just an interesting thing. Uh, based on what you said, I I could make a counterpoint to what I had said earlier. Um, maybe it's a, maybe it's a weird feminist thing where they want the woman to be in charge. They want the woman to uh, mani- manipulate people in order to e- empower her in a weird way. I don't know. Andrew, I don't know if I agree with that. Andrew, we're this close in that loop. No, I know you know that I know that you know, but you know that I know that you know. <laughs> no, I, I think the reason I disagree with that is uh, when you read about some of the biggest stars from the golden age of Hollywood, like your Catherine Hepburns and stuff, uh, because she was headstrong, because she was independent, uh, Catherine Hepburn wore pants. She was resented and hated by those male egos running the studios. Yeah. And they labeled her box office poison. Yeah. They had a really terrible attitude toward women where they felt that women had to be compliant and just do as you're told. Um, and so, like I said, I think the femme fatale was created by Hollywood to blame someone, to say, you know, I I may have done this, but she made me do it. You know, whether it's having an affair or something like that. It was always blame the woman, blame the woman. And not to pile on, Scorpion, but <laughs> if you think about it, these very memorable, strong female characters are usually villains. Right, exactly. They're, they're, they're portrayed not, they're as not the, Yeah, they're yeah. portrayed as villains, so they're not the heroines. Yeah, yeah okay, not but the, they're still the center of... But it makes you wonder if you can put this kind of effort into creating an antagonist, <laughs> could you do something for a for a, a protagonist? protagonist yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. And now, because the media had to be involved in it too. You know who's uh, probably one of the biggest champions for strong female leads on film is James Cameron. <laughs> Shockingly, when you think about it, but oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he gave us you know a very strong Ripley and Aliens and. And uh, in Terminator, Sarah, Linda, Sarah, uh, Sarah yes, Connor. Sarah Connor, like he created these really strong uh, and, uh, female roles. Uh, I don't know her name because I haven't seen the movie, but uh, Kate Winslet in Titanic. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Rose. Yeah. <laughs> Just has to call her Even Rose. Is that her name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. character's name is, at least the first name is Rose. Yeah. Okay. But she started out as like compliant yeah. and meek and going along with everything, but Upon meeting but, Jack, she started to transform. Yeah, into she was going to offer herself. Strong woman. Yeah, exactly. Is just there, to get I, out. I have not and will n- never see uh, any of the Avatar movies. Is there a strong female? Yes. Oh, yeah. I know. Um, what's Zoe? I, uh, I know Rip, Zoe Rip, Rip, Ripley's. Uh, in she it, is, yeah, yeah. In the first one. Yeah. And, She's um, in the second one, too. And I then think. Zoe, Zoe. I know Zoe Saldana, Saldana yeah. is in it, but I didn't know the, the, uh, the, her character type. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, then, hey, I agree with so. you on Cameron. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He he has created some iconic roles for female leads, which is awesome. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Even, even in the Abyss. Um, oh my God, uh, the character. I know who you're talking about. Thank you. I'm drawing a blank on the actress here. Yeah, yeah. Has to happen on the podcast. I want Dang it. To, yeah, I, I'm drawing a blank. You guys got phones at your I, fingertips, but I still need to watch the Abyss. I heard it's it's great. It's it's yeah. funny. I I, 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 I I love I love sci-fi and I love uh, underwater stuff. So who are, who are we looking for? It, the Abyss, the main cast. Uh, uh, Ed Harris, Mary Elizabeth Mestrian. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Michael Bean is in it from uh, oh, Terminator. Oh, yeah. great actor. Yeah. I would I would say this, uh, Andrew, that 
uh, Congress moves faster than you do on <laughs> your movie list. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Our podcast is almost a year old, and uh, That's right. LA Confidence. Almost. Man. Our first episode was in July. It took seven years to indict Trump, man. So <laughs> maybe if you can move a little, little faster than that, I'm I'd just appreciate saying, it. You know? A win is a win. <laughs> I mean, Haley's comment will come by before you finish that list. Now we were talking about uh, real life yeah. uh, strong-headed actors, uh, actresses. I don't. You want to use the word actor now just to describe all actors? I, but be- before I go any further, mm-hmm. I I, I want to just go back to uh, Catherine Hepburn because once again, you look back now, once again through our eyes, you know, many decades removed, and with you know hindsight is twenty twenty. Why was she treated that way? Because she was stubborn, she yeah. was headstrong. She, but yeah. would 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 uh, a director or studio demand something? Well, yeah, like you you need to wear this dress and well, act more, more feminine, like, and this, and she was. Well, refused. during that era, you know, actors and actresses were under contract, and they were told what roles to play, and, and yeah. she was like, "No, I don't, I don't want to play that role," and it's like, you kind of have to, and oh. she's like, "No, I'd rather not," and. And okay. so, yeah, she developed this reputation, and um, I okay. think she emerged victorious because she's widely regarded as one of the greatest oh, yeah. actresses of all time. Oh, but yeah. She, she held held firm and, you know, I mean, got you keep, her away. I mean, you remember when, when Hollywood started, you had a lot of strong female writers and directors at the time, and then that, there was that period where all of a sudden the men start to control it. And if yeah. you think of someone like Catherine Hepburn. Do you, I was thinking about this recently. Uh, do you think that it has to do with the post-war – uh, increase in uh, macho macho things in America because I've heard repeatedly now that the, the pre-war era like in the 20s and 30s uh, even the, during the, the depression um, there wasn't as much misogyny but it increased big time well, and the attitudes towards women because part of it might have been resentment because when when World War II rolled around, you know, women had their place at home, and then when men went all overseas to fight, what happened? Women got their job. They were b- Rosie the, the Riven. Uh, B-52s right. down here in Detroit. Exactly. <laughs> right. And so here they were keeping, you know, uh, industry going here in America, and then when the war ended and men came home, women were like, okay, uh, you got to put that uh, soldering iron down and go yeah. fry up some eggs, and there and, had to been some resentment there. And the other, ha- the other side of that coin is, you had a, a couple million traumatized men Returning who saw back, yeah. the worst, who witnessed the worst, worst, so far the worst war in human history. Yeah, yeah. And so they brought that back home with them. Yeah. And so it created, uh, uh, I think, domestic friction, which I think started the increase in divorce rates. It'd be, anyway, yeah. it'd be, well, we actually, don't need to go too far down. The- it'd be interesting <laughs> to check because you you think about. In Europe, if you think about at the same time, any European women uh, directors and writers, how if how their work compared at that exact same time period? Because in oh, Europe, they yeah. saw war. They were the it. it oh, happened, right? oh yeah, World War One was well, one and two happened in Europe. I mean, the women couldn't yeah. escape it, so they saw yeah. the same horrors, if not worse. Whereas the women, American war never touched American soil over here. Right. So, so my 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 opinion would be to check out w- women directors. From France, Germany, the UK, who put out films when they would be coming of age. Andrew, are you just looking for an excuse and, and, to not watch LA Confidential? Because this sounds like exactly it's a, like like European women films from like the seventies. I think you would find some sure. like, social commentary there. Well, yeah, and and that was the point I was going to make. Listening to you talk about Europe, uh, they were more you know advanced and progressive as far as like European women were. They wore bikinis and stuff long before and, Americans and, did. So imagine, yeah. No so <laughs> imagine American housewives watching an Italian film or whatever, going, "Well, she's you know sexually independent. What I'm like cooking for my yeah. husband." Imagine, like, imagine there if had to have been an influence if they watched there. Uh, eight culture and a, class, eight and a half, or what? Uh, Federico, Federico Fellini movie. Fellini, yeah, yeah. And they think, "What is this?" <laughs> yeah. So you have to imagine that trends that originated in Europe found their way to American soil. Yes. Not only from the experiences that they had with war but through right. film through film. film and just society in general yeah, yeah. culture language yeah food 
Now, like I said, you know, we were talking about headstrong women from the golden age of Hollywood uh, who were kind of uh, belittled and reprimanded for wearing pants and being strong. Um, one actress uh, that I've done a lot of research on is Frances Farmer. Um, and it, it's kind of an interesting story because when you look back at her life, you wonder how much of it was her being headstrong and independent and how much of it was mental illness. Um, and really, it's kind of hard to reach a conclusion, even when you take in all the facts. Was it, was it men? Was it society retaliating against a woman who was headstrong and independent? Or did she suffer from, uh, from mental illness? Uh, there was a movie made um, about her starring Jessica Lange. Uh, and she was nominated for Best Actress uh, for the movie. And remember our last podcast, we were talking about crimes on film, how yep. Hollywood tends to fabri fabricate part of the story just to move the story along? Yeah. Uh, they created a totally fictional character for this movie uh, named Harry York, who was played by Sam Shepard. Um, <clears throat> and there was no real Harry York in her life. But um, – the movie was based on a biography called Shadowland by Seattle film cri critic William Arnold, who later admitted that he fabricated an awful lot of the uh, the biography, which is kind of sad. So here's another example of a man writing and fictionalizing a yeah. woman's history uh, and playing up some of the worst aspects of it. That's why everything comes into doubt when you realize that this man wrote a book who he self-admittedly uh, said that he fabricated a lot of, yeah. but, uh, so Francis was born in 1913 Seattle. Now I can't remember if it was Andrew, you were the one I was talking to. There's a Nirvana song about Francis farmer. And, uh, I didn't realize that she had this connection to Seattle. No, um, I've never yeah. So uh, apparently Francis farmer was sort of a, a role model, a hero to, um, uh, Kurt Cobain and, and, uh, his wife. Um, which, yeah, that was kind of a, a new revelation for me as I was doing research on it. Huh. But here's, so Frances Farmer had her run-ins with studio heads and stuff like that, and she did not uh, like to give in to authority. So during the wartime in 1942, uh, driving along uh, in Santa Monica, she was stopped by police for driving with her headlights on high beam during a wartime blackout. Uh, they pulled her over. They suspected her of being drunk. Uh, they put her in jail. They fined her. She, uh, she was only able to produce half of the fine. So they said, all right, we'll let you go. Get us the rest of the fine when you can. Uh, so she failed to pay the remainder of the fine. Uh, she went to Mexico for a film shoot. Uh, that all fell apart. The film, film shoot never happened came back to her Santa Monica home and found that it was occupied by another family. This home was being provided to her by the studio, if I remember correctly. So imagine she comes back in her, the house that she was living in was given to somebody else. So her mother ended up, uh, oh, and all her possessions and everything were gone. Her mother ended up renting a room at the uh, famous Knickerbocker Hotel in Hollywood um, where she lived toward the end of her career there. I visited the Knickerbocker. So much history there. That's another podcast. Yeah. Uh, we may have talked about it during our Hollywood Haunts I, uh, episode. I, uh, yeah. Well, it sounds so weird. <laughs> yeah. So in January of 1943, after Farmer had failed to pay the remainder of her, uh, her fine, a warrant was issued for her arrest. Um, around the same time, she had got into it with a studio hairdresser and um, basically like blackened her eye. So now there are these complaints coming from a studio hairdresser um, al alleging that Farmer had hit her and dislocated her jaw, it says. Uh, and she was also accused of getting into a bar brawl on Sunset Boulevard. So then on January 14th, uh, the police arrive at the Knickerbocker Hotel to arrest her. Uh, she did not go peacefully and was dragged from the hotel. Some eyewitnesses say naked, uh, wrapped in a sheet or something. And she was sentenced to 180 days in jail. And if you if you Google this, you'll find pictures of her uh, looking like a glamorous uh, woman in a prison sort of a thing. It's like right out of a movie. Uh, but she was so she was jailed for 180 days, um, or she was sentenced to 180 days. 
Um, instead of doing jail time, uh, she was transferred to a psychiatric ward of L.A. General, General Hospital on January 20th. So now people have taken control of her life. It's no longer in her control. And she's transferred from jail to this uh, psychiatric ward. Uh, there, uh, she was diagnosed as manic depressive and even paranoid schizophrenic. And then um, she was transferred to another facility where she was treated with insulin shock therapy uh, oh, without the consent of her family. Like they were basically conducting experiments on her. God. Uh, she was given the treatment for 90 consecutive days. Now, <laughs> if you don't know what, I had to look this up. If you don't know what insulin yeah, shock was, therapy does ask. to you, yeah. the treatment puts a uh, patient into an artificial temporary coma. So that's how they were treating her suspected mental illness is by uh, injecting her with insulin and putting her in a coma, which has since been discredited as a treatment. Oh, yeah, yeah it's tantamount to torture. So think about this. I have to assume that those administering this treatment were probably mostly male, conducting experiments on this woman. And, 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 and did they say in detail what type of sh shock treatment it was? Or... Well, it, the, I, the the treatment was called insulin shock right. therapy. Right. So they were put in a coma, but then what what would, else would happen? They, I guess they felt that, that that by putting her in a coma, it calmed her brain. Yeah. Oh, of, so it's, it's, uh, it's not just a, it's not electroshock. Okay, I'm sorry. Even I, though I, I, she was subjected yeah, to they, electroshock that's, therapy. They can do yeah, that I, later, I, would, yeah. I would assume. Insulin shock is basically if they... Yes, in Mr. This case, Mr. Doctor. <laughs> They give you because what insulin does is it takes sugar out of your blood and stores it in the liver and other areas. So it, okay. if you give someone too much insulin, you become hype, you know, hypoglycemic, and then you'll you'll yeah. crash. You'll be comatose. Sedated. Yeah. So imagine her because your brain runs on sugar. That's the primary energy source. Yeah. That's why if you're low on sugar, you get lack of concentration, yeah, fatigue, and right. all that. Yeah. That's yeah. why I'm so smart. I eat donuts all the time. Oh, Joe. Um, <laughs> oh, Joe. <laughs> Joe Cottonhead. That explains it. <laughs> Joke. I'll give you an Cotton Joke. Tail. Cotton tail. No, no, it's Cottonhead yeah. now. <laughs> well, are we doing Kill Bill 3? <laughs> so, <laughs> so eventually, after receiving these treatments against her will, she walked out of the Institute, uh, reached out to her family, and told her what was going on. And uh, her family uh, took guardianship of her, took her back to Seattle. Uh, she got into frequent fights with her mother, and uh, her mother ended up committing her uh, once again. Uh, being interviewed years later when Frances was act about, asked about her experiences, uh, she said that during during this second stint, uh, she did receive the electric shock uh, treatment. So imagine what this woman was undergoing yeah. during that period of her life, these these uh, experimental treatments and against like her said, will. And like you said, oh, my God, a headstrong woman. A woman with an opinion, shocker. Yeah, and, and yeah, let's put her in a coma yeah. To calm her, you know. Get this independent <laughs> demon spirit out of her. <laughs> That's right, man. That's That was society. Uh, in 1944, she was pronounced completely cured and released. Uh, but shortly after that, she was arrested for vagrancy in California. She was committed again, this time held for five years, uh, held in the hospital's high security ward for violent patients. And during her stay, she recalled unbearable terror during her stay, and I, I read some details, and I can't repeat them here, but it was excruciating, uh, that five-year I mean, period this, of her this life. This is like a form of collusion, if you think about it, with the Hollywood execs. They, if they won, they could collude against you, so you never get a work a day in your life, and yeah. if need be, they can even challenge your freedom, because you know exactly. the reason we're not hiring uh, her is because she's... Hi, look what Harvey Weinstein did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the power that they can yeah. wield. Like, hey, if you don't want to work, you don't want to work. Yeah. Now, that biography that I mentioned earlier, he claimed in the biography, and this, this got circulated as fact, that during her stint, uh, she received a lobotomy. Oh, um, there you go. That's, but, I was waiting for that. Yeah, but uh, many, many witnesses, including staff at the hospital and witnesses and stuff like that, said that uh, they, she, there's absolutely no record of her okay. uh, receiving a lobotomy. And then the author of the autobiography said, yeah, I made that part up. Um, uh, but that was circulated as fact for a long, long time, and her family had to, you know, publicly discredit that and say, no, that's not the case. Sad. And in the movie, they hint that she did receive a lobotomy in, in the movie. Oh. Um, but what probably gave rise to the rumor is that the hospital did approach the family and said, can we give her a lobotomy? And they said, no, you cannot. Because that's part of the practice. Like, hey, nothing else is working. 
Cut out the problem part. Right, exactly. Remove part of the brain. Yikes. Uh, after the, all the that. Pre-fu- prefrontal cortex? Sure. Yeah, yeah. After all that, all those years uh, being held against her will and being subjected to all these experiments, eventually she returned to life and society. She married and separated and worked various odd jobs. Um, imagine, I think at one point I had read someone like went into a bar in New York and said, didn't you used to be Francis Farmer? Um, so she held all kinds of odd jobs. Um, but then she, she started a little bit of a revival. She, uh, performed on Ed Sullivan, believe it or not, um, appeared on This Is Your Life, uh, returned to acting in a limited capacity. Uh, she hosted a daytime movie program called Francis Farmer Presents, um, but she continued to have problems with alcoholism and, oh. and was involved in a drunk driving sure. accident. And eventually she passed away uh, of uh, throat cancer in 1970 at the age of 56. Yeah, um, but oh, what, a, what a sad life. And, and it was very hard watching the, uh, the movie based on her life because all of this is depicted very uh, graphically in the film. Uh, and you wouldn't wish that on anybody. And you no. just can't help but wonder if, if all of this started because some man, maybe she rejected him uh, and sent her down this path against her will, evicting her from her house, sure. being committed against her will. Um, it wouldn't be a stretch. This. Let's put it that way. It wouldn't be a stretch. It's not like saying, you know, Area 51. I mean, this is something you could say, yeah, I could see it. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't have to really convi- make a big effort to convince people. Yeah. But um, so I, I don't know if this necessarily, you know, fits the classic uh, definition of femme fatale, but uh, here was a, a headstrong woman real life woman who was uh subjected to horrors against her will well yeah. the thing is because headstrong is or headstrong slash independent you know uh and, and intelligent that's all part of the femme fatale mix the recipe and exactly the, the other the other subtle layer about that if you think about it we're talking about all these characters what are them what about non-white you know the only other strong female character i can think of that fit that at the time that comes to mind is pam greer mm-hmm. oh, yeah. oh sure because, but other than that, you can't really th- that. So, not only do you have misogyny, then you have the extra added layer of, of racism in Hollywood sure. at the time where you can even think of, well, I'm going to write these strong black female characters, antagonists or villains as they are. And then you're like, well, <laughs> but not, yeah. it's not going to be so like, oh man, so you got to yeah. do through two levels of stuff to get to it. Yep. But, uh, what are some uh, other modern day femme fatales? Uh, Andrew, you mentioned, uh, Jessica Rabbit. Yeah. A uh, classic yeah. femme fatale. Yes. Uh, uh, uh so, uh, yeah, everyone knows who framed Roger Rabbit, uh, directed by great director uh, Robert Zemeckis. One of my all-time favorite movies. And, again, yes. she, she manipulates Eddie. Yeah. And yes. to a lesser extent, she kind of manipulates uh, Roger. Yeah, I, I love the scene where... Is it really uh, manipulating Roger? Well, she, it... she knocked him out yeah. with a frying pan yes. and then said she did it to protect yeah. him. <laughs> Put it That's classic film fatale. Yes. Hurting the man and then saying, I did it because I loved you. Yes. And then, or in this case, yeah, the she, rabbit. She'll, she'll, she'll kill and uh, she'll do whatever it takes to, to, yeah. to get what she yeah. wants. For How about her, uh, for her man? And, uh, Sharon Stone in Basic Instinct, yeah. classic. Uh, what else? You, you sent me a text with yeah. uh, some yeah. clues. Yeah. What were the other ones that were in your Do you your remember text? any of those clues? <laughs> I sent it to you too, Nick. Yeah, actually, I, guess I know, I know, I know it's, I, I know it's Ramadan, so you might have been fasting at the time, but ah. well, you know, Mazel Tov to you too, my friend. But I'm just <laughs> saying. Now the other one, I, it just came to me was, uh, I'm, I can't remember the actress's name, but uh, uh, I can't remember the movie now. Yeah, uh, yeah Harrison yeah, Ford, yeah, yeah. Blade Runner. Blade Runner, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, yeah, exactly. but you were talking about Anna de Armas in uh, Anna de Armas's character in, in the second Blade Runner. No, and no. No, you oh. weren't. You were thinking the original Blade Runner. No, the, no, Blade Sh- Blade Runner twenty forty nine. But oh. it's it's the killer, uh, the blonde uh, or not blonde. Uh, she's got bangs, bangs, and she fights him at the end. Oh, okay. She's gotcha. a, she's a, she's an oh. android. Her name's Love. Okay, right, right, I right, thought right. you were referring to Sean Young, who was in the original, the original. Blade Runner, who yeah. turns oh. out to no, be. No, in a, our text, uh, I say right. that this. The newer one is uh, 2017 better uh, yeah. than the original. Uh, right. well, you, I'm well, going to pull careful. an Andrew here and say <laughs> I've never seen 2049 yet. I've seen the original Ooh. multiple times. But you've seen the original. That's, yeah, yeah. What's, what's your I opinion, your quick opinion on 2049? I enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed it, but I would still have to put the original 
if you're ask, if you're putting putting a gun to my head, don't. But if you're putting a gun to my head, uh, <laughs> I'd say on a, a scale of one to one hundred, Blade Runner. If Blade Runner is a hundred, Blade Runner twenty forty nine is a ninety eight. Oh, oh wow! Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, it's, that's I a mean, strong and, statement. And, and I I don't strongly say that twenty forty nine is better. It's just a little bit better. Anyway, interesting. So all her, right, I'll put it on my yeah, list. Just a, just a quick run through of her. She works for. There's so many different entities in the movie i believe she works for the uh uh the wall the wallace uh corporation that makes the uh um the androids okay who's who's controlled the replicants is that yeah the replicants, yeah, replicants yeah, yeah, yeah. who is owned by a of course completely spaced out jared leto yeah hmm. and his role alone you're like well what is happening anyway wow. she is his fixer uh she's an assassin She's uh, physically very strong. Uh, she goes head to head with every man, and that she comes against. She kills lots of people. Hmm. I'm not giving too much spoilers. Away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm not going to give. She fits some of the criteria for a femme fatale for sure. Yeah, okay, but not but, not the total package. Not but. not the total package. But she she was designed by Jared Leto's character to right. be his assassin. To carry you you, out, you yeah, gave okay. this one in here saying a dark comic character who has. Played, who was played by a beautiful blonde in a 1992 film. Okay. That's, that's the one I couldn't okay. figure out. And I even searched. It's, it's a sequel to a 1989 film. Okay. She plays a semi-friend, semi-villain in the sequel to a caped crusader. Are you talking about Kim Cat, Basinger? Cat, Catwoman. Catwoman. Uh, oh, okay. You're talking about Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer. Ah, her character. Okay. Right. Uh, you know she, what? That's she will. Just... She will kill to get what she wants. All right. She will beat the crap out of Batman. And she she manipulates Batman. She manipulates him with that love. If we, right? Yeah. If we're going mm-hmm. with that thing, yeah, I like. What Zo- do you think? Zo- yeah, I like it. Oh, I, I. Well, you threw me off with the comedic performance because right. I wouldn't think of Batman as being a comedic performance. But I totally agree with you that well, I, I the mean, Catwoman character her, is a femme her, fatale. Okay, yeah. you, you could channel it. You could take Zoe Kravitz's character in the latest Batman, the one with uh, mm-hmm. oh, uh, Robert man. Pattinson. She yes. yeah, same same essence, same, same essence yeah. of a femme fatale. Uh, maybe do, do you think the character um, Catwoman was created by whoever I forgot the guy's name was Kane to, or Kane to, to, to be who... Batman's fame. Femme fatale, yeah, like long running, yeah, because there's a dynamic there. You see it in the original TV show. You see it in the yes. movies. Yes. What's so fascinating about their relationship, especially in the uh, Batman Returns movie, is that out of costume they're attracted to each other. They're falling for each other. In costume they're beating the crap out of each other. And that is, to me is such an interesting dynamic. Um, and I really wish that Batman Returns would have focused more yeah. on that and less of the Penguin. Um, but the <laughs> idea of that love-hate relationship between Batman and Catwoman is is great. And yes. I, I would love yes. to see yes. a movie that focuses only on that. that relationship. As a matter of fact, Ooh. and this is, this is uh, not a stretch to say this is considered uh, film noir, I recently watched the very first couple of episodes of the Batman animated yes. series – and that was that should have been Batman Returns. They did a really nice job of depicting the love hate relationship between Selena Kyle, Catwoman, and Bruce Wayne. It was fantastic. Remind me, is that the first time you saw that series? Well, I or... mean, I I watched the animated series, but not like religiously. Okay. And so I saw that it, the whole series was available for streaming on yes. some channel. I forget which one. That- and so I'm, I said, you know, I'm going to go back and watch the first couple episodes. And I was surprised that it was a heavy focus on that relationship time. between Catwoman and Very Batman. But time. That came out, what, 92 cool. or 93? Yeah. Right around I, that time. I yeah. was an impressionable nine-year-old kid who would, I lived in Pontiac at the time, would walk to the local 7-Eleven to get comic books Ooh. on Saturday afternoons. That's awesome. So, so uh, every day after school, uh, whenever that show was on, me and my sister, we would watch every single episode. Oh, wow. And the Joker Christmas episode is still yeah. uh, an inside joke between me and Alexa to this day. Have you seen that one? I the don't Joker. recall. I don't Joe, know if I've seen it's, it. It's... All right. It's, it's, when you get a chance, Joe, there are several, yes. there are several like, iconic episodes in that series because it was, oh, again, ahead of its time and yes. how, how they did character development okay. portrayals. So, yeah. Yeah. We just recently lost Kevin Conroy. Yeah. And I'm... Oh, yeah. 
I'm about 99% certain. I was, I was in LA. I was at the airport. I was heading to my gate and a guy passed me and I turned and looked at him and I said, Hey, how's it going? And he turned and he looked at me and then kept walking. And I'm 99% sure that was Kevin Conroy because he has a very distinctive look. Um, but some people call his portrayal of Batman in the animated series one of, if not the greatest yeah. portrayal of Batman ever. Um, that voice, uh, so so iconic. Yeah, and they carried it through through the Justice League series and as uh, uh, in the animated. It's they 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 nailed the essence of that character. Yeah. In that, it, interesting enough, you know, we're talking about femme fatales. For any for our audience out there, the the counterpoint in in for men is status fatale. Uh, and, and we were, we were actually talking about this off air where yes, and I ne- had never heard of it, but once you explained it, it, it and, everyone, everyone will know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's basically men who rely less on physique but more on their mar- like social yeah status yeah. to h- hide their like evil their evil qualities. Right, just like we were talking about earlier. I mentioned his name. I don't want to mention it again uh, that the pervert uh, executive producer on Hollywood. Mr. Oh, right, Weinstein. right. Weinstein, yeah. Yeah, to- total total potato head, you know. But in fact... That, <laughs> but, 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 but his power and his status and his connections let him do whatever the heck he wanted for a couple decades. And I think right. <laughs> with, with Weinstein, he leaned more into in, into the access point. I think uh, for me, and that's actually, that's a good one. For me, I like the examples that they're provided uh, in the article I was reading was Hannibal Lecter. Mm-hmm. Hannibal Lecter, uh, an accomplished, it's his intellect, the way he could, and uh, and Anthony Hopkins, Sir Anthony Hopkins, did a <laughs> yes, wonderful yeah. job, and the way he, he carries, like, he could lure you in, you're like, How, why would this guy kill me? Oh, I see why he can kill me now. Yeah, he's like the puppet master. Yeah. He, he's totally in cr- control of everything that's going on around him. Yeah, uh, these people always uh, score high on the sociopathy uh, uh, test. Robert De Niro's <laughs> character in Cape Fear. Oh my God, the it's drawing a blank, but you know who I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Yeah, again, that's another char- uh, example of a status fatale. You know, um, we were talking about modern interpretations of the femme yeah. fatale, even though we're going back 30 years now. But an underrated femme fatale, and it's it almost pains me to admit this because I'm not a big fan of hers. But I remember I was living in California in 1990. And a friend that I had met out there worked at a movie theater. And he said, uh, he said, hey, you want to come in uh, for a matinee? Uh, we're going to watch Dick Tracy. This was the 1990 Dick Tracy with uh, Warren Beatty. And so I show up. We had the theater all to ourselves. He brought a giant metal punch bowl, dipped it into the popcorn, <laughs> filled it up. Those were the days. <laughs> got us both drinks. We had the theater to ourselves. We watched Dick Tracy. And I got to say, probably my favorite thing that Madonna has yeah. ever done in her entire career was Breathless Mahoney in Dick Tracy. She was the classic femme fatale. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to ruin anything. But yeah, I, uh, I Andrew, at have, this point, it's, I, I don't even need to say anything. Yeah, but no, I'm, I'm interested. I love uh, just seeing the brief images when I was a kid. I was probably five or six when it came out of – the grotesque, uh, the the villains, villains, yeah, and prone I, face and flat and, top. Uh, yeah. I, I love the, the 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 color palette. Yeah, it's um, very deliberate. Primary right, colors, right? Yeah, and I recently yeah. read its uh, Wikipedia page for facts, but not um, you know no spoilers or anything about yeah, the yeah. story. And I'm like, it did, didn't get great critical reception but everyone says it's like really fun i and, loved it and, and it was and, directly yeah. influenced by 1989's batman they yeah. really? they wanted to give dick tracy the batman treatment that burton gave batman and uh, uh yeah, and you, you it, can see that it's the like movie, they yeah. stepped right off of the comic page now what if burton had directed dick tracy it, I don't think it would have been <laughs> as bright and and colorful yeah. and comic booky because well, Burton it, it tends to darker. go dark. Yeah, yeah. And um, who, so I think it got the proper treatment. Who, if you could choose, who would you have played Dick Tracy if Burton would direct it? Well, I, I thought I thought Warren Beatty. Just keep Warren. even though he was a little older when he did it. He has that square jaw, squinty eyed look yeah, that Dick yeah. Tracy had on the comic pages, and I thought he was perfectly cast in that role. Could could. Keaton pull it off? No, 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 not Keaton. No, okay. he has his his 
he doesn't have the chin. Um, oh, okay. Like if I was to cast Dick Tracy today, I might go with like Josh Brolin, you know, someone you like go. that with yeah. that steely look, square jaw. Someone between 45 and 55 years old. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I'd say yeah, Brolin, 40. Brolin, Brolin's like 50, so. Yeah, yeah. But that that would be my modern take on Tracy. But yeah. uh, if you haven't seen Dick Tracy, um, I absolutely love it. I, I own yeah. it. I've seen it multiple times. I and, need to add it to the list. And just the memory of sitting in that theater, just being my buddy all by ourselves with a punch bowl full of popcorn is one of my favorite uh, movie-going memories. R- remind me, what theater was it? This was in L.A., so I don't remember what the chain was. Oh. Um, but uh, this was this was thirty something years ago. Yeah. So nice. yeah, um, but was yeah. this before or after you met uh, Miss Barrymore on the street? Uh, that probably was after I had met a young Drew Barrymore. Yeah, I'm glad you guys were bringing up uh, uh, Dick Tracy because it got me thinking about another example of femme fatale. And I saw this is one of the first movies I saw I, that came to mind: Cool World. It had I remember that. There was Kim Basinger, uh, Kim Basinger again. Yeah, yeah, never yeah. seen it, Brad but Pitt. as a kid, I, it, it looked cool. Yeah. That was Brad Pitt. Yeah, Brad Pitt was the character. Like yeah. oh. It's a blend of live action. Yeah. It yeah. Was oh, following oh, because, oh, oh, because oh. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was so successful. Yeah. And I remember Kim Basinger, like the way oh. they drew her, I went, oh, wow. And then it was like, oh, that makes yes. sense. The live because action. Live action. And animation the character's cross. name is Holly Wood. W. Oh, so. And she yeah. wants to there become real. She wants to go from the animated world to become real. Would you consider a cheap knockoff of? Roger Rabbit? Yeah, I mean... You, or... That movie... I, I, or is if, it if, comparing apples to oranges? No, no, no. I don't think it's apples to oranges. I just think that if it weren't for the, for the success of, Roger, of Rabbit. Uh, Roger Rabbit, you never would have gotten Cool World. And Cool World wasn't as good as... It would it would have never gotten greenlit yeah, I don't after they gotten, saw yeah. the, the yeah. first four weeks of returns from yeah. Roger Rabbit. Well, that, yeah. like I said, same thing happened with Dick Tracy. I don't think yes. we would have a Dick Tracy if Batman would have flopped. that came out right, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I, and this is before your time. This is old man Johnson talking here. But when when it was announced that Tim Burton was going to do Batman and, and have this dark take, everyone had fresh in their brain Adam West in the colorful right. TV series. Right. And people were like, there's no way this is going to work. And when it came out, it blew everybody away. It was a phenomenon. Because the there was a probably, what, 22 or 23-year period when the Adam West ended, yeah, and then Keaton came on, there was no, there was no changed. Batman, just comics, just yeah. in the pages. But there yeah. was no, there was nothing filmed, and, and right? The, no, and the, right. and the comic had gotten, uh, the comic book had gotten darker too. Exactly, and uh, mainstream oh, audiences yeah. weren't aware of the direction that the comic books had taken, and so the movie reflected the darkness yeah. of the comics. But mainstream America was like, what's happening so, here? So, from your experience, true Batman. Uh, followers who had kept along throughout the time, the the quote unquote nerds, whatever you want to call them, yeah. were they pleasantly surprised yes. and absolutely yeah. loved oh, it? Oh, people lost their mind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was a because smash. It, it was I a was, phenomenon. I was five when this came out. It is one of my earliest memories. I remember shopping at a mall in Georgia, visiting my family, and I remember seeing uh, it had the the poster emblem of you know the yep. the, the, the bat signal, the gold and black. And it was a pack of either tops or whatever trading cards. Yeah, and I, I, I bought it. And if I could find those today, oh my god! <laughs> and, be- and because Batman did was doing so well, you got stuff like the Crow got made. Yes, because yeah. that's when yes. they said comic book movies can be popular. It's not Superman spinning around the world with like Richard Donner was saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the only the only uh, like you said, Superman. That was our attempt at. A, a comic book hero in film. Yeah, we had the Incredible Hulk on television and stuff, but Superman is sort of the the root of everything we've experienced up through Marvel and all that. When when they convinced us that Superman was flying around, that changed everything. Changed everything. Are you talking about the, the first feature? The original Christopher Reeve, yeah, 1978, 1978 or something. And yeah. then, so, so 11 years later was... Batman. Exactly. So, wow. That also, they I, I, I had, right there. I hadn't thought of uh, uh, those comparatively because I know the Batman movies so well. I've never completely sat through any Superman movies. 
Yeah. That's just to be. I'm just being no, honest. No, 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 no. That's fine. You know, so I, no, I but, can't blame you. I can't blame you because number three <laughs> and four, despite having Richard Pryor number three, the quality of the movie started to go down. And that's that's what I heard. Well, same yeah. thing with with Batman. Batman yeah. with Batman Forever. And, I mean, you have yeah, George and, Clooney. Well, they got campier Batman and, and Robin. Campier, yeah. yeah. And, and when Batman and Robin came out, that that almost ended. That Christopher Bam Nolan. Thing. But the crow busted in through the roof and brought it back with Christian Bale. No, but the crow and when it comes to comic movies, the crow and Blade in 1998. Blade those was, Blade the, was great. Those started to like show like yeah, you could do a gritty, art, hard art, yeah, <laughs> comic book yeah. movie, and it's not campy. You know, I just read an article that uh, opened my eyes a little bit. The article was. Uh, why we should give Batman and Robin credit. And I'm like, okay, I got to see what the hell this is about. Because I consider Batman and Robin one of the worst movies ever made, period. And what this article said was that because Batman and Robin was such an enormous failure and Warner Brothers said, we need to take a break from Batman, that led to the full-on reboot, Christopher Nolan, Batman Begins. And that was another... Like, you know how we have, like, Jurassic era and Cenozoic era and all this stuff? Yeah. So we had, like, the Superman through, you know, Batman era, and then Batman went away for a little bit, and then Batman Begins started this other era where Batman Begins begat Marvel, begat DC, begat that whole era. So this article gave credit to Batman and Robin for causing this whole rebirth of the comic book movie. That's I couldn't put it better myself. Well, and also, and I, I would also add, um, it's one of those things where the yin, yin and the yang, like whatever the bad one is, the yin got so, so bad, they had to do a 180. And you need yeah. And Christopher Nolan, they knew yeah. Christopher Nolan was brilliant because of Memento and... Um, prestige. Uh, yeah. Well, you, he, did, it, he did at, Prestige yeah. after uh, Batman Begins. Oh, yeah, that's right. But I just, anyway... But yeah, I, I was also thinking that you, like you, you talk about uh, Batman and Robin. You needed that was like one of the pinnacle. But then you had movies were getting, you know, Spider Man was getting made and the X Men was getting made, yes. and they were just uh, companies were just running these things in the ground. So I think there was a superhero fatigue, and then Christopher Nolan comes and says, "This is how you could do it." Right. Yeah, and, and then, then Dark Knight, I consider not only one of the greatest comic books ever made but one of the greatest movies ever made period yeah i I know we're wrapping up soon i just wanted to talk about um the first spider-man with toby mcguire and um the first x-men they both came out what 2000 2001 2000 yeah yeah. 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 so that kind of pushed marvel back into the popular popular consciousness consciousness film wise yeah but the movie that blew it up for marvel was john favreau's first iron man yeah. oh sure yeah yeah and i just I, I i can't give that guy enough credit yeah the mandalorian i don't think the marvel movies would have had the same impact if they would have come out any earlier than they did i felt like the technology was where it needed to be Absolutely. to give us a convincing Absolutely. iron man and everything that 10 years of marvel to me is a a such a great and era. you talk about femme fatales in there natasha romanoff <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We can go yeah. on. We can yeah. go on for hours. Yeah. All right. So we got off track a little bit, but that's fine. I love talking movies and Hollywood and all that stuff. So, hey, uh, Joe. Uh, uh, so that Nirvana song is called "Francis Farmer Will Have Her Revenge on Seattle." Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to read a, a quick, a quick, uh, the the coolest part of the lyrics. In her false witness, I hope you're still with us to see if they float or drown. Our favorite patient, display of patience, disease-covered Puget Sound. She'll come back as fire to burn all the liars. <laughs> Leave a blanket of ash on the ground. I miss the comfort in being sad. And that, oh. folks, was another episode. <laughs> there you go. Jeez. What a way to end. That's awesome. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Enjoyable as always. Thank, Thank you, you yes. for listening. Thank you for listening watching. out there. And we'll see you on the next uh, upcoming episode of Hollywood Crime Scene. Peace out. Yep, yep.